This is a Rogue Media Network podcast. This is the Fee for Service Dentist podcast. Welcome. Our guest today, Dr. Nima Aflatuni. What a great story. What a great person. What a great human being. Just recently decided to drop Delta Insurance, which is over 65% of his practice presently. What a what a phenomenal uh, conversation we have about where he came from, how he got started, how he came to that decision, and uh, how he's putting it together. As always, the Fee for Service Dentist podcast brought to you by Kettenbach, sponsored by Kettenbach, Kettenbach Dental. They're excited to announce a first major advancement in fluoride varnish treatments. No longer with alcohol or resin. Instead, patients will get their treatment with a muco adhesive dimethicone gel, which leaves the teeth and the mouth silky smooth. No more grit. Contact Kettenbach today for more details and do more varnishes that people will appreciate. Call 877-532-2123. If you like the podcast, click like, share, subscribe, share with your friends. That's how we get more of the message out. We appreciate all of you guys for listening and participating. And if you have a story and you want to tell us or you have a situation or something you want to talk about, contact me, sunnyspira at gmail.com. If you don't like what you hear, definitely contact me and let's see what we can do to make things better. My cell phone, 607-624-2962. Feel free to hit me up. Enjoy the show, folks. Have a great day. My name is Drew Burns, and I'm a part of a small group of dentists who believe something crazy. We believe the standard of care is just not good enough. We demand the best of ourselves and the best for our patients. We believe that the best way, no, the only way to practice dentistry is on our own terms. If you ask the dental consultants or the corporate CEOs, they tell you that what we're doing isn't smart, that fee-for-service dentistry is dead, and that the golden age of dentistry is over. Yet, while others focus on profits first, we focus on the patient first. And yet our offices are some of the most profitable in the entire country because we invest in ourselves and we are doing things right. It's our name on the door and it's our reputation on the line. My name is Drew Burns and I am a fee-for-service dentist. This is the Fee-for-Service Dentist Podcast and these are our stories. Welcome to the Fee-for-Service Dentist Podcast, Dr. Sonny Spirit. Today, our guest is Dr. Nima Aflatuni. And he's got a really interesting story, and I can't wait to get into it. We talked a little bit off air, and uh, I I ran into him, so to speak, online, and he was talking about recently dropping Delta and going fee-for-service. So I said, hey, you want to talk on the fee-for-service podcast? And literally less than 48 hours, yes, we're taking care of this. So that's that's <laughs> my kind of guy, man. No moss grows yeah. under his feet. I love it. Uh, Let me give you a little background. Dr. Aflatuni owns a general practice in Gold River, Gold River, California, and he currently serves on the California Dental Association Board of Managers, and he is the president-elect of Sacramento District Dental Society, fellow Pierre Fichard Academy, hey, I'm in there too, fellow International yeah. College of Dentals, Dentists, he's a part and owner, excuse me, owner of Gold River Smiles. And that's located in Gold River, California. And we'll put his information on the uh, show notes. And he enjoys playing tennis, auto racing. Well, that's a new one. And spending time with his wife and daughter. So welcome. Nima, how you doing, man? Thank you, Sonny. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. I was excited, man. You took you took the ball and ran with it real quick. I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. I'm just going to be a good uh, interview. I can't I wait. I was excited, too. And I was honored you asked me. I uh, can't wait. So... We talked a little off air. Talk a little bit. Let's get a little bit of your background so people can appreciate. Where, where, where's uh, where's uh, your birthplace and home? Uh, I was born in Tehran, Iran in 1979. Just gave away my age. Um, we fled uh, after the uh, Islamic Revolution. Um, in 1983, we uh, you were moved four. to Portland, Oregon. I was four years old. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Any siblings? Just me. Okay. Just me. I'm the only egg right. that hatched. Just me. <laughs> All right. So four years old, you guys fled Iran to go to Portland, Portland, Portland Oregon. Oregon. Nice. Mm -hmm. What well, now? Family, friends, there. What? What was Portland, Oregon? Why was that the spot? Uh, you know, 
a bunch of uh my dad's brothers ended up moving to Portland and okay. uh we just ended up there kind of the immigrant story right one person goes and everyone else follows yeah yeah, yeah. but <laughs> that gotta... helps you know build a new community right because if you go it, it does it right? does like if you say it's listen important. it's important Eugene Montana you'd be like I don't know a soul here that's a little harder right right so that's right. cool yeah. so you guys you guys go there and what what are your tell us a little bit about your folks uh, my dad uh, and my mom they actually met in dental school in in, in Iran, um, and so uh, you know d- dentistry has kind of been a big part of my family. <laughs> actually, my grandfather was a uh, dentist and an eye surgeon, uh, ophthalmologist in rural Iran. So he he had he went, he went to both dental school and medical school. So he'd be doing you know extractions one day, and he'd be doing. Uh, you know, surgery the next day. Um, wow. So, yeah. I was going to set up two kind of different opportunities, don't you think? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how they did in rural Iran. I kind of don't want to oh. know. So. <laughs> I don't want to see that that bill from the uh, supply company. Oh, you're going to need a special <laughs> scope over here. Oh, you're going to need a CBC. You know, like, holy cow. Oh, God. That's yeah. Cool. They must have a field day with them. I don't think you have to deal with Delta Dental the way we do, though. So, yeah. Uh, was, did, did they talk about I, mean, I was just going to go there. What was it like? I mean, you were four. Maybe you didn't get the feel for it, but your folks had to talk about it what was the practice of dentistry like in Iran you know my dad would tell me uh first of all it was totally different I mean the way dentists would be seen uh respected um in his in his day it'd be it'd be next level I mean my dad would do everything from you know regular crowns and bridges to perio surgery to everything and he would just say people would just come with cash and every day he'd just walk out with a suitcase full of cash and Watch the bank on the way home, and that's just that's just how it was. There wasn't, there wasn't. There was no third party. There was, there's no third parties. Wow. There was there was uh, you know, I don't think there was OSHA. <laughs> I so don't was think it like there a was city? a lot of things. Did he practice in Iran? Um, he he practiced. So he was in the military, and he practiced uh, in the south of Iran for a while, and then in Tehran. Um, okay. we were actually uh. My mom had a practice in, in Tehran as well. And, uh, you know, won't get into this story too much. Uh, don't have time for it. But, uh, you know, there was a point where uh, my family was on the run from the Revolutionary Guard. And so my father was on the run from them. And he had to kind of work in hiding uh, in my mom's practice, kind of under her name. So um, oh, wow. we were, uh, yeah, we were of a religious minority, the Baha'i faith, um, who was heavily persecuted. Uh, after the uh, uh, Khomeini and his allies took over, so um, yeah, it became became kind of an interesting situation for many of us, my family included. Oh, it's good that you got out. It's very good that we got out. Wow. <laughs> Otherwise, right, I probably so, wouldn't be so, here talking to so you. So, what does your what does your dad's road look like in the United States now? Does he have to go another year or two to get a, a, an American license, or what happens? So, um, he tried to get into uh, OHSU. Um, but, uh, you know, this was 1984 and there was a lot of anti-Iranian sentiment in the United States at the time. So he was basically told, he was basically told like, don't even bother, you know, really? like you're from, you're from Iran. Yeah. (laughs) That was a different time. Wow. So, uh, so, you know, um, at that point it wasn't required like it is now to take a IDS program. Uh, yeah. for a licensure um, and so he just studied for the national boards he passed it um, and then he uh, just cal- just took the state boards he took California's board because we were considering moving to California he passed it and then he passed a uh, Hawaii's board which was Hawaii's board was the most uh, difficult in the country at the time I think and he passed that one when and, did you move um, to Hawaii 89 okay and so... uh, moved to the big island and grew up there all right, so you you came over. You said in eighty three, right? Eighty three. So eighty four. So you're in Oregon for five years, right? Before you go to Hawaii, and and your dad mm-hmm. is practicing at that point in time. He's not. No. So we we did not. Um, he was not practicing for about five, wow. five six years. Yeah, we were we we're living off what we brought from Iran, basically. My parents took everything they had, um, liquidated it into uh, gold coins and uh, lined the inside of the suitcase with these gold coins um, because you weren't supposed to bring any any wealth out of the country. I mean, they would sure. confiscate it. 
I mean, we had to have we had to have fake passports and visas to get out. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's what we what we did. And we lived six years, uh, just just kind of on what on what they brought over, and lived in a small apartment in Portland, Oregon, and you know had a pretty had a pretty humble humble beginning during that time. But you know, and, and you're going to public school, I'm assuming, right? And you got to learn oh, yeah. English, right? Or did you speak English? for sure? You know, I learned English pretty quickly when you're when you're when you're four years old. It wasn't sure. it came pretty quick. Um, but yeah, but my dad had to learn English and take the boards in English. So <laughs> yeah, that's not easy. Yeah, it was. Pass it wasn't them. easy. Yeah, it yeah, was. Uh, it was. It was a difficult few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You passed the first time. So so he takes the California Hawaii boards, and then you guys relocate to the Big Guy Hawaii, right? Correct. Yeah. Now, does he start practice then, or? How he does, did. Yeah, he was, he uh he got a job for uh Hawaii Family Dental Centers. It was this uh large DSO, like one yeah. of the original ones in yeah. Hawaii. <laughs> I've heard of them. And have you? Yeah, he was uh he was the dentist there in Waikoloa, Hawaii for about 16 years. And I had the pleasure of growing up there and uh you know, going to a great school. Um uh and uh yeah, it was it was just a it was just an amazing experience. Honestly, I feel very grateful to have the opportunity to grow up in the Big Island of Hawaii. <laughs> so now, but now, what happens? Talk about the difference now in the business practice of, of dentistry in Iran to now the business practice in a corporate world in Hawaii. He had to be like completely blown away at the differences. No. Oh sure. I mean, I haven't spoken to him about that, but. Um... He, uh, I think he liked maybe the level of organization that he just showed up to work and he, and he just worked, you know? And, uh, I remember my dad was really crushing it. He was always their top producer, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, always doing very well, uh, for the company. He never bought his own practice when we were there, uh, in uh -huh. Hawaii, um, but uh, you know, I think he liked the fact that he was kind of in this organized um, system, and he was mm -hmm. the director of the clinic. And I don't know, um, he just he just never bothered kind of branching out on his own until he came to California. Um, but when was uh, that? That was in two thousand and four, I believe, two thousand five. Okay. And now, where are you at in in your life? Because you're you're in Hawaii for sixteen years, so that means you're probably ready to graduate high school. Well, I was there for 16. I was there until I, until I turned 18. And then I graduated high school and uh, went to UC Davis. Um, I studied genetics uh, at first, uh, just like everyone else. I was pre-med. And then um, uh -huh. I started shadowing a bunch of physicians. I started uh, getting their take on the state of medicine. And yeah. um, I mean, no knock to our doctors and physicians, but uh, many of them that I spoke with, the vast majority were incredibly unhappy yeah. um, for one reason or another, incredibly unhappy. And I'm like, why am I killing myself to do this when this is the outcome? You know, I mean, I, it, it wasn't just one or two. It was almost every single one. And so that um, I just always had it in my head. I come from a long line of doctors and dentists. Uh, most of my uncles are physicians, long physicians. So it's, it was kind of it, it was expected you know, that I was going to go into the field. And, and then I, I decided that that's not what I wanted for my life. Um, and so I finished up with a degree in genetics. And, uh, and when I graduated, I was working for a, for a biotech startup in the Bay Area. Um, we developed systems that could, uh, for the government, um, government contracts that could detect uh, biowarfare agents like anthrax and smallpox. Um, and uh, at that point, I actually was working on uh, projects for the FBI and Homeland Security that I ended up with a couple of patents for. Um, and so, so think, that was kind of a... So think, just think of where you came from, right? You're fleeing right. Iran, and now you're coming up with technology that the, your new country, your new home country... 100%. Can use. Yeah. That's amazing. 100%. That's yeah. cool, man. Yeah, it so, is cool, so at what point, and how many years were you in uh, the private industry? A couple years, two, two, three years. Um, so, and then, so when do you get the itch to do your own thing? You know, I was looking what the, for what the next step was going to be. And um, 
you know, I was moving up, but um, you're, you're quite limited if you don't have a PhD or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you get your MBA and just go hustle and go the sales route. Neither of those really sounded super intriguing to me. Um, I really wanted, uh, I, was, I was thinking back to my dad being in Hawaii and how, you know, the culture there um, is it's beautiful, but it's not super welcome to outsiders. Mm -hmm. um, and so my family was very well embraced by the Hawaiians and the Hawaiian culture. Um, and so I went back, I remembered my dad how the uh, community embraced him. And um, I thought, man, dentistry really is cool. You get to you mm -hmm. know, be your own boss. You get to be your own, have your own business. Uh, you get to be part of the community. You can make good money. So it kind of, my wheel started turning and I got in touch with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Nader Nader Shah, who's the Dean of Pacific currently. Okay. At the time he was a group practice administrator at UOP. I said, hey, I'm just this local guy in the in the in the area would you mind if i come shadow some students you know get a feel of you know what what dentistry is all cool. i mean i yeah it was cool i mean growing up my dad would you know show me stuff and show me i remember seeing his prep teeth that used to work on before the boards or stuff he would break home bring home or uh my dad was crazy i remember once i came home and uh i saw his portable unit out there with my mom's l'oreal makeup mirror out and he's literally prepping an onlay on himself i mean <laughs> <laughs> and that onlay lasted 20 years until i replaced it just a few years ago so i mean it's that was that was that's pretty impressive <laughs> all right so and, and so, so you, you know I, you have the pre-requirements to now go for the dental school dat's and everything or like do you have the undergrad um you know i had a you know, I had all the kind, all the pre-required, most of the pre-required courses. But you know, at at the point I said I was going to be pre-med, I wasn't really pushing myself to sure. get you know, and so I was just kind of saying, ah, whatever, I'll graduate with a three O, I don't care, you know. And so, um, I uh, once I once once I shadowed you know some students at at Pacific, I really fell in love with it, and uh, I fell in love with the school too. I mean, um, uh, I'm like, man, I really want to do dentistry, and I want to come here this is it. You know, I started making a lot of connections there and, um, and I went back to, uh, start taking courses at Berkeley, um, to up my GPA. And I realized I had to crush the DAT, DAT. So I ended up, uh, quitting my job and, uh, studying full-time for the DAT and, uh, taking courses. And, you know, I ended up doing incredibly well in both. So, nice. um, yeah. Yeah. And so, and so, and then I ended up getting into Pacific and, um, the, and the, and the rest is history. So you start dental school about the age most people graduate then up straight in, right? So you're starting dental school. Correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, I started dental school when I was about 20, okay, so I graduated. It was about, probably I was 26, actually. 26, 26 27. Okay. Yeah, Good for you. 27, probably, yeah. But you, you got to offer that. We had a couple of people in my dental school class. You know, pretty much the standard was, okay, college right out of high school, boom. But there was a couple of people like yourself who had gone into careers, engineering. One person was in a dental lab. They came to dental school, and they they brought a different experience to everybody. It was kind of cool. So, so yeah, you're, you're, sure. you're committed. Were you, during dental school, were you like, hey, I'm going to do a general dentistry so I can do all the stuff my dad did? Or, or were you like, hey, I might want to specialize? What were, what were your thoughts in your dental school? I really love cosmetic dentistry. I really liked, uh, you know, comprehensive yeah, dentistry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I really, I, I really enjoyed that piece of it. Um, cool. I enjoyed some surgery as well. Um, but yeah, to your point, there was a there was a group of us older guys, and uh, we're still really good friends to this day. Uh, that's, that's so great. yeah, we, yeah, yeah. So it's, the diversity. Uh, it was, I mean, the more diverse, the better. The better the experience, in my opinion. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And you, we brought a maturity, I guess, maturity, but, uh, looking back on it, I don't, I wouldn't say we're very mature at all. Not mature. <laughs> I was not going to use that word. I don't care. Man. No, you can't no get not at all. School if you're going to be mature, you have to be a child. Again. No, no, that experience yeah. like anybody, it's, it's a grind. So, all right. So, you. so you're in dental school, you finish and what's, what's your path? What do you do? What's your first step when you graduate? 
graduated in 2010. Um, I always kind of had this dream of, uh, you know, opening my own office in San Francisco and staying there. Um, it didn't really work out that way. The economy was great. I needed a job. I ended up um, getting a job with Pacific Dental Services in Sacramento. And so my, my dad at this point, they had moved, my parents had moved from Hawaii to Sacramento and they had, uh, my dad had bought a practice. He, he ended up working for DSO for a couple of years and then he bought his own practice and kind of started from scratch there in Elk Grove. And um, I ended up getting a job with PDS for, um, and that was my first job out of school. And um, this is what I share with a lot of new dentists. Um, no, no experience is bad experience. Right. All experience is good experience, especially the bad experience. Mm -hmm. Bad experiences. You learn more yeah. from the bad experiences than you do from the good ones. Yeah, I, I and, totally agree. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that first job I had out of dental school was by far the worst <laughs> experience I have ever had. Uh, that office I worked at, um, everything, it was truly just uh it, it it was it was just terrible uh i'll be honest and so um i learned what i don't want to do and right. the kind yeah. of things i don't want to be and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for that um and so i think it would have been i mean i have friends who went straight into this private private practices where they had mentors and all the support and that's that's great too you know but i think getting kind of, kind of thrown in the fire a little bit and so, um, you know, I mean, uh, I feel grateful for uh, for experiencing that, and you know, kind of, it's kind of built me as who I am and my values. So, like you said, it taught you what you didn't want to do. So at this point, you got to be formulating, really dialing in what you want your practice to look like, and what you want it to be and feel. I'm gonna jump Correct. to the final question on this part. Is do you have that now? Yeah. Okay. So what was your first, what was your, my dental practice 1.0 version then? Like, what, what did you, what did you say to yourself? This is how I'm going to practice. What were some of the things that you came out of there saying, this is how I want to do things? I want to be able to sleep at night. I want to be able to do what's right for patients. I want so to be ethics. able to do the ethics. I want to be able to do the kind of dentistry I want to do. And there is a price to be paid. There's a, there's a, there's a price for that. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way that some of these large DSOs, corporate models are doing it, they're going to take every cheap insurance under the book. They're going to underpay their dentists and they're going to push them to over treat. And that's just the, that's just the dirty secret, you know, mm -hmm. and that's how they make their money. And so it's, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in doing that. I believe in doing quality, good work and treating people right. People aren't dumb. They know, they might not know, you know, what you no, know. They justify There's, it, right? They justify it. They justify it. Exactly. Or rationalize but, but it, I think is the word. They right? rationalize it. But mm -hmm. people aren't dumb. They, after a while, they, they can tell if they're being taken advantage of, you know? And so, listen, Sonny, life is short. And this was my mm -hmm. point in wanting to go fee for service, drop Delta. You could be... You could be gone tomorrow, honestly. I mean, I've had, I had a, you know, friend growing up in Hawaii who passed away at 31 to leukemia and he passed away within a week, you know, Oof. and um, it was horrible. It's not fair. And so, and no, it's not. It was, it, was a, it was a very traumatic experience for me. And I was actually helping him through his symptoms all week. And, you know, his, it goes back to what they told you in world pathology. He had lower lip numbness. And so he called me first and then uh, he just progressed. Um, and so, you know, it taught me that life is so short, right? You want to, you want to do what's right for people, know your own value and set your own path, you know, just, just, just do the right things and, and, uh, and, and good things will happen, you know? And so that's, that's part of the big reason why, you know, I decided mm -hmm. to do what I did for Delta as well. And that's, and that's, uh, and that's, and that, and that, and that's what I took away from my experiences. I mean, listen, we all, we all want to make as much money as we can, which is great. You know what I mean? But sometimes you have to wonder at what cost, right? At that what should cost be a byproduct of what you do. That shouldn't be the aim. Yeah. That should that's not be opinion. the aim. 
110% sunny. That should not be the aim. If your aim is to just crush and make as much money as you can, go into finance. You're gonna, you you're know? gonna yeah, but go. you're gonna make some questionable ethical decisions. Hundred percent. Like and there's no the patient won't no know the difference. Put this in exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, it starts off slow. It starts off with making those small ethical concessions, the, the small ones, you know, little by little by little by little. And eventually you start justifying bigger and bigger ethical yeah ethical uh, decisions and eventually you look at yourself and you're just you're not who you once were and remember so, what you said i want to sleep at night like that's i want to sleep at night right? yeah that says a lot to me right like i you know when i shave in the mirror i want to like who i'm looking at you know what i mean like right totally one thing totally. my dad used to tell me all the time yeah 100 yeah. percent, man and that's uh, and that's worth more than anything that's worth more than any amount of money yeah all right. So what's your first step then? And first of all, you're with PDS how long? A year? A uh, year and a half. Um, okay. At the same time, Just I was close. working. Yeah. It's longer than most. Yeah. Um, I, I was, uh, and yeah, I mean, I won't get into how I ended up leaving, but it was it's same old story. Um, and They, they uh, took the up, money. They didn't pay you right. There was questionable yeah, exactly. other things, right? And then they Pushing, wanted to... Come after pushing you. me out you know yeah. at this point i was really getting involved in organized dentistry and and uh, they wanted my opinion on dso's I actually went to the ada gave my opinion about them and it was it was just a big big mess but anyways um and then i ended up coming out and working as an associate for private practice um you know i i came on with a promise of um partnership at the very beginning but that carrot was kind of just dangled in front of me the whole yeah. time Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finally mm -hmm. pushed him on it, and when I was, uh, um, I, this opportunity came up to buy into this partnership, and um, I went, I went to them. I told them, "Hey, I want to be upfront, upfront with you. This is my, this is what I've been proposed, and um, I want to know what your goals are. You know, what your transition plan is." They didn't like that. I kind of put them on the spot, and so you know, they let me go. At the same time. That partnership, that deal failed because this was about 2013, getting into 2014. And in California, well, all over the country, Delta was phasing out the premier plan. And the other partners were premier, and I would be coming on as the PPO partner. Right. And that wasn't going to work. That was not going to work. Not really and so that, that deal failed, and they could not, he could not sell the share of the practice. They, the other partners, had to absorb his practice because of that change. And that's when I first became truly aware of the Delta PPO situation. Um, and so I went out on my own, kind of worked at different offices until until I found uh, two, two guys who had been practicing together in Gold River um, that shared a space, both had great reputations in the community. Um, okay. Been there for a long time, 30 years. Um, the way I found it, this is uh, what I tell all all young dentists um work on your relationships and your connections um you know that's how i got into dental school <laughs> that's with you and so I, i'm just I, saying you, I, you, I yeah, you're living walking breathing proof of that like what you how you lived your life yeah yeah i mean i showed up and i started making connections with you know the professors people in the admin i went to um you know i remember i went, I went up to craig yarborough Who's a, who's a friend of mine to this day. And I said, uh, Dr. Yarbrough, this is where I want to go to school, what I need to do to come here, you know? And so he said, all right, Nima, this is what you have to do. You have to prove that you can do this. And boom, boom, boom. With, with that question, with that question, there's no gray area. Yeah, you're totally. Not saying, no gray you know, area. How does someone, you're like, what do I need to do to get in? Totally. And that's it. And when they look at your application, you know, I mean, it's... And then just uh, so when I was looking for practices, I, I I went out and started meeting with the uh, practice brokers and got to know them and, you know, take them out for drinks, take them out, take them out to dinner, you know, just and then when that, yeah, just be a person. But, but when that good practice comes along, that really, really that one with some with some potential, they're going to call you first before they, they list it, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's what happened. And so this was a, you know, when I looked at the numbers um both of them together were uh were doing about 1.2 and uh they had a very busy hygiene schedule 
and I looked at how many, I looked at in 2013 and 2014, how many quads of scaling and root planning their hygienists did, and it was four. Going out of network can be really scary, but staying in network can be even scarier and riskier too long-term. Insurance reimbursements aren't even keeping pace with inflation, which can really affect the quality of your work, not to mention the quality of your life. I'm Allison Bernstein. I'm Dr. Josh Bernstein. We went out of network over 20 years ago, and we can show you what worked, what didn't, and how you can do it with minimal risk. Thriveoutofnetwork.com teaches you everything you need to know, including the most important part, which is getting your team on board. It teaches them how to communicate with patients and getting them comfortable with the entire process. Go to thriveoutofnetwork.com and check it out today. That's thriveoutofnetwork.com. And so, and so, I mean, I'm, and, I, and I, I'm looking at the dentistry and, you know, it's kind of, it's just old school, you know, just uh, a lot of watches, a lot of monitors, mm -hmm. um, you know, they had been, they had been done, they, they were over it, you know, you could tell. And so there was, and at that point, I'm like, okay, it, it, the practice was about 60% Delta. And if I'm going to be taking on both of these practices, right, um, there's room to grow. There's room, I'll be taking a hit by being in network with Delta PPO, but I can make up for it, right? Um, no one's taken an FMX in over 10 years, right? I mean, everything's analog. Like there's, there's a lot of room to grow here. And so I purchased the practice in, uh, in 2015 and uh, both practices merged them. And then, uh, off I went, I had to. So wait, wait, know, they were space sharing partners. Did you say that? In the beginning? They were space sharing partners. Correct. So, so two so separate practices that ran out of the same address. Yeah. Ran out of the same address and they shared some of the same staff. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's, yeah. that's like a win-win. That's a win-win. Yeah. yeah. And so for the um, patients, bought, especially totally for the patients, they're going to stay in one location. They're going to see the same smiley faces that they're used to. Right. You know? Totally. Yeah. Same, same, everything, um, you know, things ended up changing over the course of the next few years, people ended up moving and, you know, I had to bring in new systems and yeah, and I, not, course, everybody's, I, not everybody's going to roll with you in the same direction because change 100%. is not always adapted. So totally 100 percent. And so. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I was able to do I was able to be incredibly successful with uh, even with Delta, but it was always just. Um, such uh, I, I was able to do it by just really working myself to the bone mm -hmm. and. I mean, I mean that literally. I'm developing uh, stage three osteoarthritis in my right thumb, and so um, at at 45, which you usually don't get until you're in your in your 70s. Oh, and man, so, well, if you're gonna say your 60s, I was gonna spit at you. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like okay, because I'm 60. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, you. Interesting. You don't look Interesting. Yeah. How many hours? Thank you. How many hours were you working? I was working five days a week. So five um, days so a week, you're working as a dentist. Correct. And I don't. Yeah. You know, people probably have no idea what you were doing outside of the practice now because you're you're managing and running the whole thing, right? So I remember right. when I first started, I was working probably forty hours in my practice. I had two nursing homes I was doing. That was my, you know, I was probably working fifty five hours of dentistry, and then I was probably doing another thirty books payroll you know bouncers all that stuff payables oh yeah so how much oh, were you yeah. putting in on time with all that when you had all that in just like you said probably like 60 hours a week i mean yeah. just 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 trying to figure this place out trying to figure out what i need to do to you know bring it up to speed um managing staff i mean mm -hmm. uh dealing so with what did you do? Because I know myself, I, I kind of yearn for like practice managers like Linda Miles, Jennifer D. St. George, like some of these who were the kind of top speakers in what they called practice management in those days. And it was really trying to teach you a little bit of patient and, and team relationships, right? I, I mm -hmm. wanted that as much as I could. So I dove into that, kind of lean into that. What did you see as you know, okay, now you're 
you're on your own ship, you're sailing it, you're going to do it your way, you're, you're, you're trying to incorporate all these people under your now, your home, right? So all these patients, I'm the new doctor, here's how we, and we're going to incorporate, you know, modern dentistry things. What were some things that you said, I really got to get into this stuff? Um, well, first was, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't want to spend the money at the time and uh, I kind of wish I did on, on bringing on, uh, too many consultants. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, you know, uh, you picked the wrong one. At, it set you back a long way, but go it, ahead. It, it can set you back. And, you know, initially I had one and she was great for certain things. Um, and, uh, you know, but I realized that I might need someone else to come on and help me. So I, I leaned on my previous relationships. So I used to work with um, someone who uh, uh, at the previous practice I was an associate at who was amazing with billing, amazing with, um, with uh, collections, um, a lot of great qualities. So, you know, I contacted them to see if they want to work for me. And I, I, I kind of did that throughout my past, all, all the, all the key people throughout my, you know, working past that, uh, that were great at what they do. I brought them into the practice. I realized that I need to incorporate technology because technology, scanning, milling, um, digital dentistry. Um, and I worked with, uh, you know, my, my contacts at, at Sarek, Serona, um, you know, other places to help me really build the practice up in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, and then, and then I worked on putting, you know, the, the correct systems together, the financial systems, the, you know, billing systems, recall systems. Um, and, you know, my current office manager who I brought on back then helped me, helped me set that up. Um, you know, I was fairly green. I didn't really know who was who in dentistry. And so, uh, now I do though. <laughs> and so I just didn't know who to trust. I'll be honest with you. So I mm -hmm. kind of relied on what I did know and people I didn't know had a massive monthly, um, nut with the, uh, with, with the loan sure. payment. So uh, I became very judicious on how, on how I spent money. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I had to keep my margins at a certain amount. So I had to, um, you know, I, I I couldn't use expensive labs. So I had to, I had to, I had to, I had to in-house mill myself, but I wanted to have that control. And also, cause I know my work was good. So I, I wanted to focus on doing, you know, really quality work, but I, I couldn't pay the fees. Right. And so, so that, so that, uh, the, that continued for a while. Um, but as, as the years went on, you know, the cost kept going up and um, the, the amount of, that Delta was paying was not changing. And being a network with PPO, you're writing off 40 to 50% of your fee. Um, you know, a crown at that point, I remember horses around the crown was $727. That was the Delta fee, you know? And what was um, your regular fee? Uh, at that point, it was about 1300. Okay, um, so, okay, 45%, 40%. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, I knew that it was a change that I had to make. I just didn't have, I just didn't feel comfortable with where I was at the practice at the time. And to feel that I had the right people in place, the right systems in place. I didn't feel that I had the name recognition, in the community. I didn't feel that I had, um, you know, mm -hmm. the loyalty of the patients. Um, but what was your overhead? What was your overhead, by the way? At that point, it was probably between 65 to 70%, 65, 65%. So it was costing you 20%. So Every Delta patient yeah. you saw cost you 20 cents on a dollar out of your pocket, 25 cents. Right, right, right. And so- um, That's just upside down math, right? That's that's a George Bush. Math. That's fuzzy math, baby. <laughs> it is fuzzy math. It's fuzzy. And it gets and it gets fuzzier. The higher you raise your fees, the, yeah. you know, I mean, it gets it, it gets yeah, the, the delta The Delta between the two, you like that? The that Delta. Yes, between the, the delta. two becomes bigger. It, it goes does. bigger. Good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it just, uh, it wasn't a question of if I needed to drop them as when, and, um, and it came to a point where, you know, it, it just, it just made sense to do it now. The what, time what was your epiphany. What was your moment? What was your moment? You said, that's it. I'm done. I'm doing this. What, 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 what was it? Everybody has some, some event or some thought that says, that's it. I remember you Josh know, Bernstein. Josh was, 
they wouldn't give him a, 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 a 2% raise or something in the fees. And he said, that's it. I'm done. January 1st, you know, and uh, Dan Elm, and just some of the different people I spoke to, there's always some moment where that was it. How about yourself? I'll be perfectly honest, Sonny. I reached the point um, maybe about a couple years ago where I was really not enjoying dentistry. I was, I was mm -hmm. hating it. Yeah. You know, I was, I would go into the office. I'd be like, I hate this. Why did I pick this profession? I'm grinding myself away. And I'm, I feel like I'm coming in and I'm being taken advantage of every day by this Ford company. Um, mm -hmm. Pennies on the dollar. Um, I don't enjoy this. Um, and, you know, I got on the board of managers for the California Dental Association, allowed me to start meeting dentists from all over the country who, um, and I've been involved in dental leadership for a while. I was, mm -hmm. Uh, ADA council for practice. Yeah. I've been delegates for a while, all this stuff. And so I've gotten to know people, but I start to get to know real clinical legends and masters, you know, of clinical dentistry. And it just kind of opened my eyes. I'm, I'm like, man, these guys are doing the kind of dentistry I've always wanted to do. And why can't I do this? Oh, because I can't charge the fee that I need to. Um, and then I, you know, it's never too late in your career to start developing mentors, right? Never too late. Never. And I met, I met Jeff Brusha, who runs Face, and mm -hmm. amazing dentist, amazing uh, restorative dentist. And so um, he's kind of taking me under his wing a little bit. And so he's been, uh, uh, you know, I took Face, and I, and I went to AAED, American Academy of Psych Dentistry, last year. And it just opened my eyes to, hey, you know, you can do this kind of dentistry. You can do this this level of dentistry that that these guys are doing i mean and 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 you can be passionate about it and it just it just reignited just this passion in me to start bringing in focusing on more complex cases doing more complex dentistry really getting into every aspect of it um i just met a uh, dr uh, dar radfar uh radfar seminars uh started incorporating sleep into into the, into the practice and i decided that you know life is so short Life is too short to wake up every day and feel like you're being taken advantage of. You know, I want to take control of my life. I want to mm -hmm. take control of my destiny. And so, um, and this is all within my control. And so that's, that's the time I made the decision that we're, we're doing this. I'm not going to let some company dictate to me um, what, what they're going to pay and just pay me pennies on the dollar. Um, I'm going to take control of my own independence. And honestly, it's so funny that I made that decision to do it on the third and everyone on that Facebook group was posting, you know, happy independence day. And I'm like, Oh my God, I didn't even realize I'm doing it. And it is, it is truly my independence day. Um, mm -hmm. And breaking away from this tyranny of, of, of this company is, is my independence day. Um, and it's, it's the most American thing you can do, honestly, you know, and it is, I gotta be honest what what Delta is doing, what these, what these large insurance, it's, it's anti-American. It's taken away your rights. It's taken away your freedoms, um, and you know it's uh, it feels incredibly liberating. So mm -hmm. that's so that you was, decided that, July third, right? Was your day? July third is when I sent the letter. Yeah. So the letter's been sent to the insurance company Delta. Mm -hmm. that you're going to mm -hmm. be out of network. In was it ninety days? What do you got to give them? So. You know, my consultant tells me it's uh, 30 to 45 days, but I've been hearing it's 90 days. So I don't really know what um, what the uh, what what it's going to be. I'm hoping it's I'm hoping it's September 1st. That was always a target. So okay. now, have yeah. you started telling patients that this is what you're doing or is that starting up? We did. So we we started way back in January and we there started. Uh, yep. Yeah. You had a and plan. so. Well, yeah. So this was this was my plan. So this was my plan when I bought the office. Was first I had to get the buy-in of the staff, mm -hmm. especially specifically the hygienists, because they're the ones that have the relationships, and they're the ones that can have the, those quiet conversations when you're not in the room. So you got to have to have their buy-in. Um, you have to make them make them believe in your vision and make them believe in you. And so that's why that's what I originally did with with the team when it came to doing this. I explained to them, hey, this is my vision of the kind of practice I want to have. You know, having patients who truly value us coming to see us 
us providing the really truly next level of care for them. Um, you know, pushing us ourselves for, you know, more CE, more pushing ourselves professionally, uh, personally to really just be the best professionals we can be. And once I got the buy-in from the staff and once I helped them open their eyes to how being in network with Delta prevents us from doing those things, then they could start having the conversation with the patients. And they would explain to the patients that, you know, we're changing our relationship with Delta Dental and we need to do this to maintain quality of care. You can still use your insurance. Um, we're here to help you, um, you know, manage that. And, and we would track the conversations in the ledger. The conversations went well. We'd give them one code. If they, you know, if they threw their hands up in the air and walked out of the office, then they would get another code. And that helps us kind of give a kind of an idea of what the percentages are of people that are incredibly unhappy about, you know, our change initially and those who are on the fence and those who don't care at all. And so um, along with that, uh, you know, came, you know, an idea that, so we're going to be losing our uh, top, top source of marketing because basically dental benefits is marketing. It's just, it's a marketing expense. And a lot of people believe that. And, 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 I, and I do too. Um, yep. And so you need, you, you need to figure out how you're going to replace that marketing source. So I'm, I'm in the process of doing that right now, um, figuring out, you know, who we are as a practice, wh what our values are, what our mission is. We've, you know, we've talked about that with my team a bit, but, um, and, and helping to really um, translate that into a new marketing campaign to really blast out in a very coordinated way to the community to help bring in new patients. And what's also your, focusing what's your on- percent? What's your percent of patients that are Delta? 65. 65. Yeah, significant. Okay. It's almost three out of four patients. Come in. It's almost three out of four patients. So um, I think, uh, you know, I'm working with a consultant on this. Sure. I know you don't need one. Um, I felt it was, uh, it's been helpful to, um, with the team especially, um, to calibrate them. Um, he sees a 15 to 20% drop. I see more of a 30 to 40% drop, honestly. Mm. It's it's not going to be forty percent. I can guarantee it, because it's it's not. in your, it's it, 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 I don't know what the hell am I talking about, but I I just think, listening to you, you've got the conviction, you've got the mindset, you understand it. Now it's going to be the communication aspect. I think right, making sure the message right. is this is how this benefits you, the patient, not. Oh, by the way, this benefits us because we're going to have more money coming in. Now, this benefits right. you as a patient because you now have 100%. a seat at the table without someone interfering with your care that has no business and no concern about the care you receive. All they care about 100%. is got to be as cheap as possible. You know, that's a great point, Sunny. And uh, Dr. Varen Patel, who's in uh, Folsom, a great leader, a great friend of mine, he explains it like this. Imagine, imagine a triangle, you know, one side of it is the patient. The other side is the doctor. The other side is the dental benefit company. Only one, one part of that triangle cares about the bottom line completely. And that's, and that's, and that, and that's the dental benefit company. And so, and they're interfering in your care. And so, um, you know, taking them out is going to help, help us provide better care for you. And so, uh, yeah, you, you, you have to phrase it in a way, and, and it is that it's, it's going to, it's going to benefit the patient. We're doing this for you. And we are, we're doing it so that, you know, we don't have to use, you know, cheap labs and cheap materials and have to cut corners and have to, you know, double book patients and really just, and, and you have to, if you, if, mm -hmm. if you're going to be in network with them for yeah. those low fees. I mean, you and don't so, have to take the dollars and cents number, but let's. What do you pay your hygienist an hour ballpark? Uh between fifty to sixty. All right, let's say sixty. You add in all the extra costs, you're at seventy bucks, and Delta is reimbursing on a profi for an adult seventy five dollars. Seventy two, yeah. Seventy two. You know, exactly. just. Exactly. I mean, you, it just it like just some people out. might need that conversation. You know what I mean, and other people. May not, but I think for the most part, you've burned your boats, you're going forward. And that's, that's to me, the most important aspect of people who do this successfully. Having talked to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in this space that 
it you've got to have that conviction you can't it's never look back and you're you're going to have your moments where you'll say yeah, i probably could do this but mm-hmm. I, I don't think you're going to see anywhere near 40 percent I, I, I yeah i was 20. i'm being i'm being i'm being i'm being overly pessimistic on that sure. but i mean i figured well you take know, worst case scenario let's say you lose worst 40%. case scenario yeah if you lose 40 still... percent, you keep 35 percent. let's say you lose half of them let's say you lose totally. half of your delta right I'm still making what I'm making now. I mean, I mean the bottom line. Yeah, and, and now you and have more time to do I have more what time. you need to do. I have more time to spend with patients. I have more time to talk to them. To uh, you know, I have more time. I have more time. More and time to see patients and, at a full fee. At a full fee, and that's and I'm and I'm totally fine with that. You know, um, you know, especially to, and, and and talk about time. You know, it's it's just, you know such a thing for me. I mean, I have a five year old daughter, and uh, I just. It goes by so fast, Sonny. And so, yep. you know, you, you realize you want to be there. You want to be there as much as you can. You don't want anything interfering in that. And, and you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're grinding yourself at the office all day, you know, because you have to, right? Because your fees mm-hmm. are low. You know, it's taking time away from your family. It's taking time away from your kids. It's taking time away from you doing, you leading the life that you want to lead. And so... And, and that's not, where... Remember you said you were starting to hate dentistry. That's where that right. genesis comes from. Right? That's where you it start, came from. You start to really resent almost yourself. And it's just yes. an unhealthy place. It's an unhealthy space to be in because now yeah. patients that really want and they, they, like you enjoy seeing, you're, you're not your full self. And, and totally. You know, you know you need to be. And and that's cool that you came to that rec- that recognition. And epiphany. And you, and you know, at some, at some point, I mean, I'll touch on this, but we got to talk about the the mental health crisis in dentistry. You know, 100%. it's it's a, it's a crisis. We are a profession in crisis, mm-hmm. um, and I think we all know stories. Um, we want to talk about them, but we all know stories. We all have them, mm-hmm. and um, you know, we we got to take control of our profession. We got to take mm-hmm. control of ourselves. And really build build a better future for all of us because, um, you know, it's in our control and mm-hmm. it can it can be pretty bleak for us, but it doesn't need to be. Remember you said relationships. Think about the relationships and what you said in this talk, like who you leaned on and who you went back to. And if you don't have that relationship or those relationships around you or accessible to you. I feel yeah. sorry for you because it's it, that's the old 1960 dental practice where you practice in a cave. You, you only came out on Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, you know, to peek around and go back in. And then and then the, the insurance companies figured out, well, we can go in and we can take advantage of that isolation mentality and tell them, listen, if you don't join this plan, the guy down the street is you're going to be out of practice. And, and And when there's no communication among the dentists, that right. happens. And and you can see, and when you're in the, in a bad way mentally, and you don't feel you've got someone or some someone to talk to, it's a bad spot to be in. So I, I think the, the most bad spot to be in. This you know things like this, the podcast, the conversations, the friendships. Like I consider you right now a friend. Like I could call you and talk to you about anything. Same here. And it's like this. This is what helps the profession, and ultimately, it's going to help the, the public. And I think what's hurt us in the public's eye and why we're no longer viewed as a respected profession as we used to be is because of the business of dentistry stepping over the practice of dentistry. And it became a number. 100%. It became a numbers game. We got no one to blame but ourselves. It became a numbers game and it's hurt our patients and it's hurt us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hurt us as professionals. It's hurt, it's, it's hurt us personally too um and 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 that has to change i do i am concerned now with you know the large number of dentists who have sold out to private equity what yep. that looks like you know i mean there are some groups out there that are great there's some groups out there there are a lot out there that are not and so um we just need to take control and uh mm-hmm. we need to take this profession back and realize how great it is how amazing a profession it is how lucky we are to be a part of it but but we have to take control of it because there's a lot of people who are trying to take control away from us. Yeah, look to medicine. I mean, just look what they've done. Yep, 
You know, there's right yeah. the blueprints right in front of you. We can follow that. Oh yeah. Not. And yeah, you, you probably, exactly. I mean, I, I don't know how old you are now, but I mean, you're you're probably in the, at the point where you might be getting approached by the different private equities. I get them all the time. You know, like yeah, hey, let oh, us yeah. come in and we'll do this. And you know, the bottom line, someone said that I think it was Michael Abernathy talked about it, and he said something uh, to to the effect which I thought was interesting. They're not really interested in making your practice that much more profitable. What they're interested in is amassing these practices and then flipping them i call it the greater fool to the next fool that if they yeah. bought you at a four multiple they're going to flip it over and sell it at a 10 multiple so they make That's money in just the transaction right it's just yeah, you know they should be damned yeah, oh yeah i mean i mean i mean that's private equity that's that that's how the whole that's how, how private equity works you know right. you consolidate you increase value and you sell off at a higher multiple yeah. And the uh, and 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 then the shareholders get a piece; they get a dividend. So it's that's just that's just that, that's just how it works. And I mean, I think I mean it's fine. I mean, it's fine if that's what, if that's what you want to do. I know a lot a lot of friends who've done that, yeah, and that's and that's okay. And um, you know, I I think there are some groups out there that are better than others. You know, that really support the dentist and give them control and and you know, um, but I I do fear you know that there's a lot of them that are not, and so it's gonna. It's the the people who are going to suffer in the end are going to be the the patients, but also the dentists. Yeah. Because I I don't think the deal is as sweet as they thought it was going to be at the very beginning. You know. The, yeah, they're they not just going to be able to. Right. They they throw out that number right away. Here's the number, but it's not really the number. You you got to figure out how no, they get not. to that number. Here's what we're going to give you today. Then you're going to right. work for three to five years at a severely reduced rate from what you are at so you're going to give them back if you it, it, versus if you kept the practice right for the right. three years so you're going to give them back a significant amount well add that back off take that back off of the sale price what they told you you were getting and then you have equity shares or however they structure it you know it's 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 a tough i'm i'm not a fan i also one. don't believe it's as high as people think it's talking to no. like christine and uh and Maria, they were in Jill in this alliance of independent dentists, you know, that it's the numbers are not as high as people believe because you've been you've been seeing this glamour, glamorization, maybe glamorization, mm -hmm. glamorization, mm -hmm. glamorizing it, I guess, is the better way for dumbass to yeah. say it. They're glamorizing <laughs> it. And that's what it looks yeah. like, you know, but I don't think that that's that's the true story. Right. No, I agree with you. I think. Uh, and, you know, I mean, a big part of the sales, right, they're trying to. The people that that are going to benefit from this is not the selling dentist. It's the it's the group that that's buying the practice. So mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it might it might seem like a deal that's that's too good too good to be true, and in many cases it is. But you know, I know I know some friends who who've done it and done and they've done quite well. They've they're and right. they're and they're doing, they're doing well at it. There there's some groups that are smaller that are a lot more dentist focused, and you know, I can see I can see why they would fill out to those groups which are fine but i think most of them are are not so um mm -hmm. just gotta be careful but you know it comes down to control sunny mm -hmm. it comes down about controlling your destiny right and being fee for service um you know having the practice that you want um doing the kind of dentistry you want to do um all being in your control and giving you the time that you have to enjoy your life you know mm -hmm. enjoy your so time with your family do the things you will, you've always wanted to do because we're not here for that long. So um, don't, don't spend it being miserable. Don't spend it, you know, feeling you're being taken advantage of just, just take control, you know, just, I mean, it takes some courage to do it. Honestly, it takes, it takes some, because it's scary, but you know, yeah. everything, everything good in life is scary. So, so you got, <laughs> you got hard. we got to have a follow-up in uh, let's assume it's three months. We got to have a follow-up like November uh -huh. or something. So hit me up. Let's, sure. let's, Let's circle back and let's go through how it's going. Uh, I mean, I'm so glad that I reached out to you. I'm so glad you responded the way you did. So much, and, Sonny. Uh, appreciate it, man. I, I love what you're talking about. The, the organized dentistry, too, I think that's an interesting component because they take a lot of heat, right? Well, they're terrible. They're not sure. representing us. Well, it's kind of the only solution we really have collectively. And I think we kind of have to be members. And I think it's better if we're active members like yourself. You know, you want to talk a little yeah. bit about that? 
Sure. You're absolutely right. We get, you know, organized dentistry gets a lot of heat, but I think a lot of that has to do with maybe a failure of communication from comp- groups like the ADA, maybe our state components to really explain what the reality is and the situation is. And we're truly doing the best we can, um, you know, as big a, as we are as, a, as these associations, we're small compared to the power these uh, dental benefit companies have, the oh, amount nice. of funding they have. And so, yeah. um, and so we've, there's, there's, there's lawsuits. We, we've tried to take Delta down with lawsuits from, you know, ADA, CDA, multiple ones. And we're always looking for ways that we can, we can fight. Um, and, um, you know, it might not seem like, seem like that to the membership, but as someone who's, you know, worked on the inside with uh, organized dentistry, I, I can tell you that um, we're doing, you know, probably not everything we can because there's always ways to do things better, but um, it's, it's, it's the best we can do. And sometimes it, fall, it comes up short, but it's not for a lack of trying. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's important to maintain your membership. Uh, it's important support your local society support the ada um because it's what we have and we 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 need these groups to fight for us Mm -hmm. but what we're fighting against is truly truly a giant um and so that's uh you know i i I think we do better at communicating that's that's really a big part of it and can't agree more um okay final question if you could go back in time anywhere any place and do anything with anybody where would you go why <laughs> oh man uh that's a go back in time <laughs> you know i would go back and uh maybe call my grandfather a bit more and get to know him a bit better my, he uh they stayed in iran my grandmother and my grandfather we never saw them again and uh you know i was i was a kid at the time but he passed away when i was in college um i would have uh i would have loved to go back and maybe maybe call him and just just have a long conversation with him that's that's what i would have what, what i what i would like to do age creates wisdom and when you have wisdom you look <laughs> back and you think on these little things right you know yeah, you do for sure. You wouldn't have said sure. this probably twenty years ago. I would probably not. No, probably not. Probably not. Because you appreciate it. Yeah. You have your own child, your own family, your parent. You know, yeah. What I, mean? like, yeah. I think yeah, one of those a, things changes. He's the one guy I think I'm most alike. You know, it's uh, it's it. Everyone always says that. So, um, you know, he just he just passed away. Uh, when it was uh, it was I was in my second year at UC Davis, and so. Yeah, I just wish I would have uh, bothered picking up the phone and calling mm-hmm. Iran, you know, and just just talking to him for 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 a while. And you know, he was an amazing man. Um, he had an, he had an amazing life. So uh, that's one thing I would have I would love to do. All right, man, that's personal. That's deep. I love it. My dad just celebrated his ninetieth birthday, and I got to spend oh my some gosh, kind of cool. Happy still birthday to your dad. Thank you. Oh, he had yeah. a big, a big That's impact cool. on my career too. You know, and I got thinking. I was like, you know, when we started this journey with the one office, and then as we moved and picked up a second, and moved, you know, and as we created our organization, he he had a lot of experience that he passed along to myself, uh, the docs I work with now, a couple of partners. You know, just how, how the whole organization grew. He had a lot, a lot to do with it. So we talked about That's that so for cool. a time. It was That's nice awesome. to. I'd spent too much time busting his chops that that it was nice to kind of give him, you know, give him his flowers, as they say, you know, so it was right. Nice. That's cool. Well, I appreciate That's so you, cool. man. I appreciate you, you, Sonny. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for listening to the fee for service dentist podcast. If you would like to share your fee for service story, please fill out our contact form at ffsdentistry.com. Also, be sure to join our fee for service dentistry Facebook group. For help starting your dental membership plan, visit dentalmembershipdirect.com and membershipmastercourse.com. Finally, for help with in-house financing, visit dentalfinancingdirect.com. And don't forget, your story is what you make of it. This is your name on the door and your reputation on the line. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.
This has been a Rogue Media Network production.